Well, good morning. You're not going to hear me do things like gavel in because that's not what this meeting is. It's a study session. We're all casual today. See? <laughs> casual. You've never seen me wear a jeans jacket in this room. Um, and thus, this meeting is supposed to run in a more casual way. The purpose of this meeting is to be able to have dialogue between council members and city staff. Why are we up here? Um, it really is a way to just give extra levels of transparency and be able to um, record this so that others can see it later. There are other of our colleagues that aren't able to necessarily be here today. Um, but it just as extra access to the public, we're making this available in this room. I wish that we were down here on regular footing with you all as we would be like we do most study sessions, which are across the hall in room 319. So there will be no things like roll call. We will take no council actions today or votes. This is truly meant, while this room isn't set up for it the best, to be um, a, a dialogue with the participants as listed on the agenda, which is um, this morning, we're talking about the Office of Community Safety. And so council members, the mayor, um, all of you leaders of the Office of Community Safety, um, Commissioner Alexander. Um, so we will start, as we have in this agenda, with um, brief presentations uh, to set up that dialogue. And I presume that the way, Commissioner and Mayor, that you would maybe want to go through this would be that after the different components of the Office of Community Safety speak, maybe that would be a good time for questions, or if you would rather, we could wait until the end. What say you, Commissioner? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Well, then, without any further delay, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, Mayor Fry. We will, one formality that we will use just to try to keep an organized conversation is we are going to use the chat in Microsoft Teams as a way to kind of put yourself in queue. I'm also going to ask that instead of having like 10, a series of 10 questions, that you ask your question, maybe a follow-up if you need clarification, and then let somebody else go get back in queue so that everybody has an opportunity um, to get their questions out. Some people, you might see council members coming in and out is their schedule allows today, um, but this is truly set up to be a more informal time to learn from city staff, um, to ask questions, and so forth. So I'll kick it, I'll turn it over to Mayor Fry. Thank you, Madam Vice President, members of the City Council, honored to be here today with all of you. Uh, as the commissioner mentioned, whether questions are asked following the presentations of each respective department within the Office of Community Safety or they take place after, either one works just fine for us. However, I will ask, it, would it be okay or is there any objection uh, if the commissioner sat up next, here, next, next to me while we do this? It's just a little bit easier for purposes of managing the PowerPoint. Yeah, there's um, no objection to that. I, I, I'll just add, that I, again, if there's any objection, we're fine doing it otherwise, but it just is a little bit easier for purposes of presentation. Um, this is Councilmember Vita's spot. I have not asked her yet, as she's <laughs> not here, uh, but given that there's some other seats available, um, she's coming. Um, it's all right, we'll make room for you up here somewhere, Commissioner. Oh. Or you could be where the city attorney normally sits. Maybe that's a good problem with that is it's not easy then for us to yeah, coordinate to the presentation. Yep. Go up. It, it looks like Commissioner Vita Thank has you. given you some space here. <laughs> and again, just for those who just came in, I'm facilitating this discussion as the chair of Committee of the Whole, but this is meant to be an informal study session. Um, so. Thank you, ahead. Council Members. Uh, so we're kicking off here uh, the presentation on what our Office of Community Safety will look like. Some of the details you have already heard, some of them are soon to be presented, but we wanted to, in a public fashion, provide you as much information as we possibly have, given that there are still decisions that need to be made that come through, for instance, the budgetary process. Um, if we could kick off here with uh, slide one in the intro slide. And 
let's just move on to slide two, which is the government structure background. So on November of 2021, as you know, the voters passed ballot question number one, which designated uh, a clear executive and mayor and a clear legislative body and council. And with the passage of this question and the will of, of the voters, we have now embarked on a uh, uh, hundred years in the making uh, restructure of our local government. Uh, this restructure process will ultimately provide a local government uh, that is more responsive to residents' needs. Uh, it'll help us become more efficient, more equitable, and more effective in providing those basic and critical services that we have to our city. Next slide. In December of 2021, I convened three work groups uh, around public safety, economic recovery, uh, and government structure. Those groups each had a unique focus, all dedicated to ensuring that we made the most out of this transition period uh, as we moved from 2021 into 2022 and then from 2022 to 23. Next slide. The government structure work group was charged with researching and recommending options that I could choose from that would best fit the needs that we have here locally in Minneapolis. As you all know, uh, next slide, the government structure work group provided three recommendations in their final report. These are options from which we could choose. Uh, they mentioned a deputy mayor system, which they largely recommended against. Uh, giving the potential for backlog. Um, there was a, a, a CAO system or a, a sort of, that, was, that was recommended. Um, and, and then the final piece was this, this system with, with three different or with multiple different report structures. Uh, the work group representing a, a real broad range of backgrounds and perspectives, they met seven times in December and January for two to three hours each time. Uh, and the reason this, having this work group was so set up is so that we could do community engagement that provided the parameters around what we are and are not deciding, that they could dig in in a real intentional way to provide not just off the cuff remarks on how the government should be set up, but a real deep sense of how we should structure our government going forward, which takes a lot of work. Um, they looked at a chief administrative officer system, which is Duluth. They looked at a city manager system of Fresno, a chief of staff system in Houston, uh, the city coordinator system that we have had here in Minneapolis, a deputy mayor system of St. Paul, and a chief operating officer system of San Diego. These are just a few examples of cities that we have looked at to provide this structure. They conducted reviews of these situated cities. Uh, and they developed three alternative options, which I have mentioned. I chose option number three, moving on to slide six, uh, which has multiple reports to the mayor, including, as you should see there, uh, a commissioner of the Office of Community Safety, uh, a, a COO or chief operations officer, and a city attorney, as well as a chief of staff. Again, that is just the structure on the executive side, of course, there is also a structure that you all have purview over on the legislative side. The work group found that, that there are many subtleties in terms of how cities are organized, and these subtleties need to match the uniqueness of our Minneapolis city government. Uh, there are some core principles like clarity of roles, responsiveness, proper delegation of duties, professionalism, and accountability that are all applicable and can be found in the government structure that has been recommended. Next slide. After selecting a structure, we formed internal city staff-led groups to look at different areas of how this work uh, could impact our local government. Uh, so there were six groups in total that we brought together to make sure that we were thoughtful in how implementation took place. That was legal, uh, the operations impact, which was largely through uh, human resources and, fine, and IT, uh, the Office of Community Safety, uh, and the applicable departments that report up through it, the Office of Public Service and the applicable departments that run up through it, communications, and race equity impact. These groups have been planning for the changes that are needed to implement an executive mayor structure, and the new structure is designed to provide efficient, effective, and equitable government services for our residents. Even after these uh, policymaker decisions are made and, and our role here is complete, 
Uh, our HR, IT, facilities, legal, and other integration teams will be hard at work making sure that those, effect, those changes are ultimately effectuated. Uh, and and uh, th this touches on a lot of stuff that we may not be involved in on the day-to-day -day activities. This is timesheets and how IT is structured. This is administrative support and all of these other pieces that need to be coordinated to set up a pro properly functioning government. Some key highlights, uh, a part of the government structure that we are submitting and that we are speaking on today. Obviously, the big one is the Office of Community Safety, and, and that's where you'll get the vast majority of your presentation today. A couple of other key highlights include uh, race equity, inclusion, and belonging is in its own department, and the uh, city attorney's office uh, representing both the mayor and the council. Uh, slide nine, you can see the OCS organizational chart. Um, there shouldn't really be anything new here. Um, this organizational chart has uh, all entities from 911, fire, Minneapolis Police Department, uh, emergency services, and uh, Office of Neighborhood. It's the Office of Violence Prevention that we have switched over to the Office of Neighborhood Safety. At some point, I'll remember the name. Um, <clears throat> and so the, the whole, one of the big purposes here, of course, was to make sure that there was an individual in the commissioner that was in charge of overseeing. Um, and so the, uh, similar to the government structure work group, the community safety work group um, presented its final recommendations in June. Now, importantly, they recommended an office of community safety as well. Uh, this work group, it was independent of any other government structure conversations. They recommended this comprehensive and integrated approach uh, and prioritized community safety across city departments. This, as I've mentioned before, really is a shared goal among voters, among elected officials, and the work group. Uh, we all want a comprehensive and integrated approach. This is something that we all agree on, and let's agree to agree. Uh, so I am setting up this office so that there is one person, the commissioner, with oversight of day-to-day -day functions of each safety department. This allows that one person in the commissioner who has subject matter experience uh, and can be dedicated to coordinating these five entities. Uh, now, importantly, uh, we're still, I as mayor, I'm certainly still able to have conversations with each respective department, but what it does is it gives greater accountability uh, and greater oversight and coordination because that work is done full time by an individual in the commissioner. It brings all of these different departments together. It effectively integrates our safety systems and improves collaboration across many departments. Uh, and it is our belief that it will also strengthen community safety for all residents by thinking and acting differently than we have before across all safety services. Uh, so to achieve these goals that I've mentioned and outlined, I am recommending the creation of this Office of Community Safety. Next slide, uh, this is 12. The work of each individual department remains critical. In addition to funding the start of an Office of Community Safety for my 2023 to 24 proposed budget, um, we're, we're making sure that we're doubling down on the commitment to safety beyond policing while ensuring we have the necessary police staffing to complement these emerging portfolios. Uh, so here's a few pieces from the budget because uh, obviously they run part and parcel with the restructure itself. Uh, the, the budget transitions the Office of Violence Prevention to ongoing general funds in 2024 using both 3.3 million in ARPA funds in 2023 and then elevates the office to a new standalone department called the Department of Neighborhood Safety. Uh, it expands the Behavioral Crisis Response Program with a $1.45 million investment in 2023 and increasing to $2.9 million in 2024. Additionally, it adds five full-time employees to support the office of the commissioner. That's uh, including a chief of staff, administrative, and communications support. So these are the, the primary pieces and the, an overarching vantage point as to what we're working on. Most of this, I believe you already knew, either through uh, presentations on the government structure or uh, presentations in the budget, but we wanted to reiterate the directional 
uh, sense that we have at the moment. Uh, and with that, uh, I will uh, turn it over to our Commissioner of the Office of Community Safety, Commissioner Alexander. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to be here, and thank you, uh, Councilmember Palisano. Uh, over the last several weeks, and actually 30 days as of yesterday, uh, mark my time being here as I have officially taken the role as Commissioner of Community Safety. And certainly I have been working to identify uh, some of the areas of integration across all five departments, which you've heard me talk about before. Uh, so that we can uh, tackle immediately and simultaneously targeting longer term goals. One of the things I've observed in the time that I've been here and having an opportunity to bring these five departments together that have been previously outlined here is that during the succession of our weekly meetings, we have been able to have an opportunity to talk about what our strengths are individually as departments, but more importantly, we've had the opportunity also to share what some of our challenges may have been. But what we have learned in our collaboration with each other on a weekly basis is that we share a lot in common. And having the opportunity to have broken down many of those silos because we had not been communicating with each other uh, in peacetime, if you will, and when things are calm, it really have, have allowed us the opportunity to share, talk about, think about challenges that may come before us even before they become an issue. And I think that's what's hugely important in this process and hugely important in this, in this whole office of community safety. So I've seen huge benefit from it, and I'm, shortly you're going to hear from those five department heads, and they will honestly share their own experiences about how they have uh, uh, experienced the process over the last 30 days. But as we continue to evolve and, and things take place, resources, needs of our various programs will also change, which is why it is cru crucial that we are taking stock of what we have now and determine what is deficient and we're sufficient in. You know, here again, uh, let me state, if I haven't stated before, I've also had the opportunity to meet with a number of outside partners throughout jurisdictions in and around the metro area here in Minneapolis, partnerships that uh, I feel that we need to regain a sense of confidence and trust in, and they have been very open uh, to having those conversations. They have been very welcoming in my time here. And those relationships and groundwork that we have to build and continue to enhance Though those collaborative relationships is hugely important, not just for the office itself or overall, for the overall safety of this community. So one way we evolve our work is to work in-house, includes evolving the way we work with our outside neighbors to better share resources and information. And we've continuing to do that. And in fact, we even have an opportunity to enhance our possibilities of being able to work with outside agencies and communities other than ourselves, which we're going to be very dependent on them, and certainly we want them to be dependent on us in our shared relationship. So that's hugely important for us. Change is underway. We have begun the work of transitioning the fully resourced and staff uh, behavioral crisis response team into the Department of Neighborhood Safety. As the transition moves forward, I want to be clear I remain committed to building out and improving and expanding our, altern our alternative emergency response program. There is great value in complementing our law enforcement services with, uh, with instant specific response programs, and we as a city will continue to move forward in this work. I also have established standing uh, meetings with all five department heads so that we can establish and reinforce a shared understanding of each other's work. Uh, this allows us to identify opportunities, again, here in areas to collaborate and to pool information and resources. We also have begun utilizing live tabletop uh, uh, scenarios to run through scenarios, I should say, that would better prepare us for critical incidents. I think we always want to be in a position of preparation because we know that any community at any time right here in this city, of course, could experience some type of event, and we need to be prepared as we can uh, should those events arise. 
And this is one way in which we will build our plan out while also keeping us sharp. And we're also creating shared spaces so that we can physically bring departments together in emergency situations for more holistic and coordinated response. Uh, the items that I'm that I am covering today reflect the changes we're implemented based on the government restructure, not the day-to-day -day operational changes uh, we are working on in order to fight crime. The same way we scrutinize police, which we have in the past, is the same way I will also scrutinize the other four uh, departments that are under my watch, because I think with constructive scrutiny, it provides us an opportunity to uh, to strive and to get better at what it is that we do. But of course, we have to be willing to uh, challenge ourselves internally just as much as we're being challenged externally. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before you, were you gonna introduce the chief? Yes, and with, with that, Commissioner, and, and, and you can feel free to, to, to introduce, I guess, your respect. Yes, department. well, actually, yes. before you do, if, sure. if I may, Please, yeah, um, I just wanted to mention some of the other people that I see in the room. I don't want to assume that everybody up here on the dais necessarily knows faces and names um, and everything, but there are. it's important to mention that one of the ways when we scheduled these study sessions that we wanted to make sure um, that we were certain to invite our race and equity team. And I see Director Green and Mr. Nash here today. Thank you for being here. They are leading the race equity impact analysis of the government restructure work. Um, and other people that I see here in the audience today include Commissioner Latonia Reeves, include our budget director, Amelia Kruver, include Brian Smith from the Office of Performance and Innovation, um, include many people from the mayor's office um, and other community partners as well as members of the public. I'm wondering, uh, Fatima Moore, obviously you know her um, as our, from our city coordinator's office. Um, and then the other members here are the leadership of the Office of Community Safety. Have I forgotten anybody? I, I, you always risk that when you start to name people <laughs> here, but I just want all of my colleagues to know who's here um, because there might be questions. And we will run questions more um, through the chair and I will be passing them to you, to, uh, of course, obviously, if there's a question for a chief or somebody, it's gonna go directly to them, I presume. So thank you, I just wanted to interject that. Um, go ahead and start thank following you. up your leadership team. So I wanna have an opportunity to introduce who uh, each uh, department head, which you all well know, but to give them an opportunity, if I could, uh, to share here their experience uh, under this new Office of Community Safety. And what I asked them to do was to be as honest and forthright uh, with you all about what their experiences are. So, and I think they all are going to do that, I am quite certain. So I would like to ask Chief Tyner if you would just take two or three minutes to Introduce your experience, please. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Madam Vice President and members of the council. Uh, I don't have a, a, a whole lot to say. I'm not going to take up a whole lot of your time. But what I will tell you is that uh, my experience in the, under this new structure has, uh, I think we've seen an improvement in our interdepartment communication. I think it's the biggest thing. Uh, prior to this structure, oftentimes, uh, if I wanted to uh, communicate with another department, I might have to, you know, track down that other department head or, or you know, work, you know, a little bit harder. But now that we're meeting weekly, uh, that interdepartmental communication, I think, has improved greatly. Uh, the other thing that I've noticed is, is uh, we're starting to work, I think, more effectively toward shared goals that we all have, uh, training and, and kind of talking about the division of labor and how we're each going to uh, operate and how that inter interconnects with the given incident. So, for instance, uh, you know, if we have an emergency, I, I have I have a pretty good idea what 911 is going to do. I have a decent idea of what uh, the police department is going to do. But oftentimes, I didn't know, you know, exactly what their strategy was going to be. And uh, you know, sometimes they may not jive 
as well with what we're trying to accomplish. And so we would have to kind of work that out uh, through, you know, on scene, uh, through uh, a kind of unified command structure. But now I think we'll have a good idea coming into it as to what we can expect from each department. And, and then if we need to make adjustments, be able to make those a lot more easily because we will have a common platform to work off of. And so uh, that's been my experience in, the, in our brief time so far together as a community of public safety. And uh, with that, I will uh, pause for questions unless we want to just move on to the next. No, we'll move on to the next thing. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Chief. Just Chief to say Hoffman. there are people in queue, and I'm just going to wait until everybody gives their introductions first and then okay. go ahead and start conversation. Welcome, Chief. Good morning. Thank you. be helpful if I didn't drop my notes. So thank you for the opportunity to talk about the Office of Community Safety. Certainly for MPD, the opportunity to have regular communication about our work with all five entities, including both short-term, immediate work, and long-term plans, uh, both community-facing and internal, um, is, is an incredible opportunity, um, as is the ability to look for areas of collaboration to leverage our resources on behalf of the Minneapolis community. MPD certainly supports the integrated work to create a safer and more peaceful city, including the entire spectrum of public safety work from prevention, intervention, deterrence, enforcement, prosecution, reentry and rehabilitation, and community building efforts. We have always worked with our partners at the fire department and 911 particularly closely because we share our response. And now this opportunity gives us a chance to plan and discuss that response more collaboratively with them on a regular basis, um, as well as to work more closely with the Office of Emergency Management to do the kind of important support work that provides increased capacity to respond to emergencies. We have worked with the Office of Neighborhood Safety in the past, particularly around the group violence intervention efforts. And so we're looking for increased opportunities to leverage those resources, particularly around our focused enforcement details, as we look at the areas of the city where violent crime is most likely to occur and the people who are most likely to be involved in violent crime, either as victims or suspects. We are identifying new opportunities for collaboration internally as well around recruiting, and I know some of my partners will talk about that as well, um, as well as training. Uh, Chief Tyner mentioned the training issue, and we have been in discussions about looking for ways to collaborate um, on emergency medical training between police and fire. Um, and we also have been talking with 911, um, inviting them to participate in some MPD training that has um, overlaps with how we work with dispatch uh, to de-escalate and intervene more effectively in crisis situations. So we are looking forward to the ongoing opportunity to work with an integrated Office of Community Safety. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Huffman. Um, Interim Director Josh Peterson. Josh. Thank you, Commissioner, and good morning, Council Vice President Paul Masano and Council members. Appreciate the time here as well, like my colleagues. Uh, so I'm Interim Director Josh Peterson. I am Interim Director of what's currently known as the Office of Violence Prevention, what is, but what is proposed to be known as the Department of Neighborhood Safety. Uh, so our work may seem maybe a bit further afield from some of the rest of the work of my colleagues here. And I think that that does naturally create some questions, but I think it also creates a lot of opportunities. So I want to talk just a little bit about that here today. Um, so my academic background is in public health. You know, I'm a public health person, so I want to speak from that perspective for just a minute here. Every chance that I get when I talk about our work, I talk about how we use public health approaches to reduce the impact of violence on communities. And so to me, that idea of public health approaches is really sort of a framework. It's about thoughtfully examining complex, multifaceted problems and coming up with complex, multifaceted solutions. It's about understanding that there's very often not just one single fix to those problems. It's about understanding that if we want to build and maintain systems of safety that can build healthy communities, that we really need to make sure that everybody's basic needs are met. It's about centering those who are most disproportionately burdened. And it's really about uh, addressing some of the big things that are inextricably linked to violence, like racism and classism and oppression and inequitable opportunity. 
And really, at the end of the day, it's about sort of taking a holistic approach to safety and thinking about both deeply seated root causes and the things that are right in front of our faces. And so that's how we approach our work. Um, and I do consider that work to be public health work. And I think it's critical that we continue to do our work from that lens and be supported in that approach. But what I really appreciate about this opportunity around the Department of, or the Office of Community Safety is that really I don't think there's sort of this, this binary relationship between what I described as public health approaches and more sort of you know, traditional community safety work. It's not zero sum, it's not one or another. I think that there are opportunities for all of these things to interact within that same kind of framework that I described. And another really frequent refrain you'll hear from me in our office is this idea that it takes all of us to prevent violence. And so I'm really encouraged by the potential for an Office of Community Safety that can promote collaboration and, and cooperation across all of these various sectors because really I think that succeeding and taking a holistic approach to finding multifaceted solutions really does require all of us. So I'm gonna step off my public, safety, or public health soapbox for just a second here to talk about some specifics of things that I've seen in the last month or so. Uh, in terms of the police department, Chief Huffman mentioned that historically we have collaborated with the police department around some of our initiatives like group violence intervention and that has been a fruitful uh, collaboration. There are also some places where we have intentionally built sort of what I would say are information firewalls and that's because in some of those cases, the success of those initiatives really depends on a certain kind of trust. And so I'm hopeful that in those particular cases when appropriate that we can continue to uh, sort of talk thoughtfully about those relationships and how we may need those information firewalls. And actually I've seen already in this past month that Chief Hoffman and I have had space for those conversations, I think in meaningful, productive ways. But I also think that you know, as we move forward, there are opportunities where we can really start to collaborate more intentionally around some of the ways that we've come together. And so already we've had conversations, for example, around how we can work with the strategic analysis unit in MPD around better understanding trends around things like where crime happens, when crime is happening, so that we can better leverage the resources that we have and bring those to the table alongside some of that information from strategic analysis. So I'm really excited about the potential for that. Uh, elsewhere, Director Lane's shop has um, exposed us to training opportunities moving forward that I'm excited about. Director Hodney has invited me down to 911 to see what's happening on the floor, and I think that having us be able to see actually what happens there is a really critical piece of understanding how our city's emergency response operations operate. And I'm also inspired by what I've heard from Chief Tyner about some of the ways that they reach across disciplines and really think about keeping people safe beyond just fighting fires. And so the work around the opioid response recovery effort, for example, that I've heard Chief Tyner talk about is really inspiring to me. So as I said before, it really does take all of us to build safe communities. And in one way or another, everybody who's been gonna be up here at the podium today, all of you, everyone in this room has a role to play in that. In this approach, I feel like really has a powerful potential to help us all get there together. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Director Joni Lotney. Good morning, Vice President and Council Members. Uh, I'm so honored to be here today to have an opportunity to share just the growth that has happened in the last month since we've been able to be together. 911 is often referred to as the first first responder, and there's a reason for that. We often know before anybody else knows what's happening out there, where the crisis of the call comes from. We're the hub of the communication piece. Often in the past, while well, each one of us individually as departments were able to do our jobs and we knew how to structure them, now this is giving us an opportunity to come together as a whole and plan that structure and that communication together. Bringing the, together the departments that respond daily to the crisis of any individual group or business has been having a tremendous opportunity for us to grow and learn how we each function in each department. We've engaged in conversations that has helped us learn more about the individual department in the forefront of public safety. Well, we have some of the most experienced leaders in each division of public safety. Prior to joining us together under one department, we did all of our functions rather siloed and handled them individually. Yes, we communicated, we had an opportunity to reach out to the other leaders in each department, but it was often an individual communication, several phone calls, multiple times of communicating with people. This has brought us all together to the same table to not only be able to 
have this collaborative team to plan for day-to-day -day things that are going on, but this is also allowing us an opportunity to talk about training, growing, and how we plan for the big events that happen in the city. So we're prepared and ready for those as they may happen to the city of Minneapolis. While we plan to collaborate as a team, we're ensuring that the entire team of public safety responders is joined on the same mission as we move through to the future of public safety. This, the Department of 911 has had the pleasure of working with the police department, the fire department, for many years. And it's always been a little unsure of the function of the Department of Office of Emergency Management, OVP department. In recent years, we've added the behavioral crisis team through, B, through the OPI group and animal control. So we've had an opportunity to really work with some departments that are out there in the forefront of the community. For me, this ability to connect with and join together has allowed me some new recruitment ideas. Working with the department heads has connected me with people in the Minneapolis Police Department. We've already established some community events that we're going to go to and start recruiting. We've put out a video, video recently to help people see what it is to work in the city of Minneapolis as a 911 dispatcher. And it's opened doors for that, com that commitment that we haven't had in the past. I look forward to continue to see where we can go with this Department of Community Safety. Thank you. Thank you. And Director Barrett Lane. Thank you, Commissioner, Council Members. Uh, pleased to be here. Uh, the last 30 days has really shown that the Office of uh, Community Safety is, a, is an incredibly valuable tool for communication enhancement. We've talked about that, uh, both on an ongoing basis, but also just getting um, the communication flow across the various components uh, on a weekly basis in of itself has been extraordinarily useful. The other thing that really I think we haven't mentioned so much is that it provides a much needed forum to bring the kind of issues that we have had in the past to each other, to have honest and you know, really robust conversations around that, uh, to make the compromises that are necessary to move forward, and I really appreciate that context. Um, and that's really the way we're going to improve. We're gonna to have to put our issues on the table we're going to have to work through them together. We're going to have to find a mutually um, supporting way to uh, deal with some of these um, things that we have to work on together, because we can only do them together. Uh, one of the things that the commissioner really has prioritized is our preparedness, which we certainly appreciate that. And he has put us, the entire team on a trajectory to more exercising, uh, more planning, more training, more preparedness. And that's something that, of course, is very uh, important to me as your emergency management director. So from an OEM perspective, and I think from a team perspective, this has been a very, very valuable um, development. Uh, it really provides us that uh, communication and decision-making forum that we were lacking to a large extent, or we had to improvise on the fly. Uh, institutionalizing that has been uh, a very strong uh, improvement to our capabilities. So uh, with that, uh, again, positive development so far. Um, I think we're really seeing things uh, come together as a team, and uh, we're willing to and certainly going to move forward as a team from here on out. Commissioner? Thank you. And I'll return it back to you, uh, Vice President Palasano. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, we have a couple of people in queue. I'll start with Council Ma Member Madam Vice Payne. President, I believe I, I have a few more slides. Oh, but you we're do. happy to take questions. Um, I, I'm just going to give mm -hmm. some of the basics regarding the ordinance timeline. Yeah, uh, why don't you do that first? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I, I will be brief. Uh, so this should be uh, slide 21, uh, talking about next steps. The ordinance changes. Uh, there's a tentative timeline that's provided here. Uh, I, I recommend that the... Uh, ordinances be uh, adopted, uh, obviously as, as soon as possible. 
Um, this allows us to get ahead of the budget process and to ensure there is adequate and approved funding for OCS. Um, I, I believe they are uh, tentatively scheduled for you know, late September slash October. Um, so changes in department reporting structure have happened already in the form of Executive Order 2022-02, uh, and the Commissioner Alexander has the authority and the oversight of each of these five departments. Uh, but we are still working with HR uh, to make sure that some of the staffing, logistics, the IT needs, and administrative assistance is, is provided and supported. Uh, and we'll ensure that all the policymakers and certainly the city staff continue to be informed about next steps. Um, my, my ask to you all is, is, is simple, is, is just please work with us. Uh, know that there will be bumps in the road as we set up an entirely new governance structure. Uh, this is the first time we have done this in over 100 years. And we're learning along the way while ensuring that we do the very best for our residents. Um, San Diego had a similar transition in that it was a relatively whole scale revamp, uh, which is what my government structure workgroup researched and interviewed, and they said, they said it took two to three years before everything was set up and in place. Now, granted, we can learn from any mistakes that they made and further expedite uh, to, to make sure that we get this government structure set up in full, but you know, there's a whole culture uh, here at the city of Minneapolis that has been embedded for, you know, 100 years, and, and some of that changes. The logistics change. Um, there will be bumps in the road, as I, as I mentioned, but my, my ask is just simply stay at, stay at the table and work with us. Uh, we're all trying to do the best by uh, our Minneapolis residents. Uh, I look forward to working with all of you and passing uh, this through uh, the charter um, as well, which is what uh, was directed to us through the will of the voters last November. Uh, I thank you for your time and uh, certainly will open it to questions. Sounds good. That's part of why we're all here today, is to work more collaboratively and more together on the Office of Community Safety. With that, Councilmember Payne, you had questions or thoughts, or thank you for kicking us off. Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Vice President. I had a question about alternatives, and just by way of background, uh, I worked uh, in the Office of Performance and Innovation to get the BCR team launched. And I was there in the early stages of that process where we were planning the logistics around launching a pilot and then having that pilot exist for a set period of time and then determining whether or not we should keep that or if it's working or not working, how we should move forward. Uh, that happened before COVID, that planning happened before COVID, that planning happened before the murder of George Floyd, before we had a contentious election about the future of public safety. And we had a fairly intentional and deliberate plan about that transition from pilot to fully operational. And obviously as you're, I, I mean, it was really good context to see, you know, this is gonna be a two to three year process. Um, we, I think that we need to be very thoughtful about how we both expand alternatives when it comes to piloting new ideas how we measure their performance on whether or not they're working and then how we transition them to fully operational new ways of keeping the community safe. So I was just wondering if there's been some thought about that because right now it's kind of a Band-Aid ripping process in terms of this transition to a new structure based on the election, but how are we thinking about this so that we can be more intentional in the future? Uh, Madam Vice President, Council Member Payne, excellent question. Uh, just to clarify, uh, the two to th three year process was the one that San Diego went through, not the necessarily at all the one that we will go through and are going through. Um, our hope and goal is to certainly learn from any mistakes that they made and so to not similarly make them and to expedite uh, in shorter form. You know, my, my hope, my hope uh, is that we get this structure up and running uh, by the beginning of next year. Um, and now granted there will still be changes that are made along the way. The ordinance will be set up, you know, in September, October, um, uh, potentially charter amendments down the way. Uh, but at least we would have the structure there that we can then make changes from. So in other words, if we need a little bit additional administrative support, they get that if, if there needs to be, um, if there needs to be some shifting in terms of uh, uh, some of the additional staffing positions, we can certainly make those through the budgetary process or otherwise. But to, but to your question, 
Uh, first, the work that you and OPI and others did to get the behavioral crisis response team set up is, was excellent. Um, it, it, I think this is a, an area where elected officials, community members, police officers, members of the Office of Community Safety agree that is a valuable asset in our city. Uh, and in ensuring that this is not just a pilot but is an ongoing piece, we are then making it uh, both citywide as well as ongoing in the budget itself. Um, and a, a member, council member, one of your asks uh, was to uh, bring it citywide until 24 7, and that is a direction that we would like to go. Um, the work that is happening now and, and is, is to again further coordinate that work. Um, single call that we can take off of the police officer's shoulders, we all know how burdened they are, uh, is, is a good step. Um, and I know and I've heard from uh, Chief Huffman how thankful she and m many of her officers are to have this additional assistance. Um, you know, I'm kind of getting around to your question, it just and just so that I, I want to make sure I'm answering it correctly. The the question was was about some of the thought process that we're yeah. Do we have like a? Are we thinking about the framework for how we both imagine new ways of responding, and then how we test those new ways of of responding, and then how we operationalize those based on some metric of performance? Yeah, so I'll turn it over to the commissioner in a second if he's got any additional ideas. Um, uh, but, but what I would say is, you know, first off, for, for, for dangerous situations where you need an officer to go in, we, we will use officers. Um, they are a, a very critical component of our overarching public safety structure, but certainly they are not the only one. Uh, behavioral crisis response has been, I think, a really important step. Um, but we're also looking at things like traffic enforcement to help in safety in nightlife. I know that Council Member Rainville is, is working on it. Um, uh, I know that we're, we're looking at additional ways to utilize more of our enterprise uh, to attack some of the items that have uh, more traditionally been in the law enforcement bucket. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Commissioner if he has anything to add, but, but yeah, we will continue to, to try and to pilot uh, and to uh, investigate and ultimately transform the way we're providing our service. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Payne. I think that's a very relevant question, particularly within the context of which we're standing up this office. Because when we think about transformation, we think about transforming public safety policing, if you will. And myself being a clinical psychologist, I certainly do welcome and understand the benefit of BCR. But even more importantly to that, I think it really has to become very much a part of what we do in public safety every day. So being able to pilot a project as such is important, but to actually make it part of your organization is part of what you do on a regular basis. It truly is woven into uh, public safety in a way that we can expand BCR over time where we'll have more professionals that are able to respond to many of these calls for service that do have a mental health component attached to them. I think that's hugely important. But in addition, I think we also, to the point of some of your question, uh, I think it's important that, yes, we have to be patient with each other as we stand up this office, because here's what you, is uniquely different uh, about this department in, I probably say this with some bias, but here's what's uniquely dif different. Uh, we're in this place of, of, of transformation, if you will, as we continue to talk about transforming policing or public safety in this country and more specifically in this city. But in addition to that, I think as we talk about it, I think we also have to recognize that public safety is very fluid. It is constantly changing. We have new issues that can erupt and evolve at any particular moment as we stand up this office. It could be around crime. It could be around a significant event that take place that could put us back on the national scene. It could be around any variety of events that could have a huge impact upon this community in which it's going to take all of us to resolve. And that likelihood is always there because we're talking public safety. And it's just so many things that could take place. So as we're standing up, it does not negate the fact that we still have to, con you know, uh, confront, 
these ever-evolving issues that are taking place in our society. We're here again, whether it's around crime, whether it's around a bridge collapse, whether it's around some severe inclement weather or civil unrest, whatever it may happen to be, we have to be prepared to respond. And I think you heard uh, uh, Director Lane even uh, 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 speak to the fact that uh, being prepared uh, for any type of, of, of situation is hugely important to us in public safety and we're trying to do things and consider things and think about things that we have not in the past. So I really do appreciate that question within context. And if I may, just as a follow-up, my question was specific to BCR, but I'm also trying to think forward-looking. We have the fentanyl crisis. We have um, unique circumstances around intimate partner uh, abuse and violence. Um, we have even just the the safety ambassador program downtown of just a, a, a physical presence that helps, you know, keep eyes on the community. Mm -hmm. These are all capabilities that mm -hmm. um, I envision us moving towards, mm -hmm. but how do we make sure that we're very intentional and deliberate about expanding those resources and those capacities. I think one thing that's going to be hugely important is those conversations be had with me, uh, with OVP, or with the Office of Neighborhood Safety Director. And in the opportunities to be able to do that, I think we have to lean forward and think about those new innovative ways in which we do business. And each one of those that you just outlined are hugely important. I think having ambassadors downtown, I've seen this in other cities before, it works well, it is forward thinking. I think when we think about the fentanyl crisis uh, in this nation and certainly in this community, how can we provide better services? How can BCR be expanded in many ways to be able to provide that service? To be able to put the metrics to it will probably be the easiest part of it all, but be able to respond to some of these types of issues that are going that we're going to be confronted with i think we also have to recognize that it's just not going to involve the few but it's going to involve the many because each one of those areas you just outlined such as fentanyl crisis that we're in uh and partner relationships abuses if you will that we know are on uptick uh, in this country we try to get out ahead of that, but we have to be conscious of it and we have to begin to talk about it. And we have to be very intentional in the sense that this is something we certainly can explore and we can begin to test and hopefully make part of a much larger program because that is the future of, of, of public safety in this country. And Madam Vice President, Council Member, if I can just add, uh, a, a lot of this work will include not only council members, but will also include entities that are outside of what we are looking at as the Office of Community Safety. You, you mentioned fentanyl. Uh, that would be a prime example where, of course, we would want to involve uh, our health department uh, and making sure that we've got accessible treatment available and that those that are administering the treatment are collaborating, collaborating directly with, um, with, for instance, BCR with our fire department, and uh, we're actually presently rolling out the safe station uh, program, uh, and of course with law enforcement on occasion. Uh, and so all of those are gonna be really important, and I think uh, the, the more people that we can have at the table that are helping with these really complex problems uh, internally, the better. Thank you. Council Member Wansley. Thank you. Um, just building upon council member, uh, Payne's question, I actually would like to have, um, division director, Brian Smith, be able to come and speak to the pilot process for, uh, BCR. I think prior to you coming in commissioner Alexander, and I will note for the public record, there's been, um, some points raised a couple of times about this structure, um, this new office, I do want to know for just clarity for the public that we have not as a legislative body as of yet passed or ordinance to make uh, the Office of Community Safety formal. So I'm assuming many of the things that are being referenced is the transitional processes, hopefully to help set that uh, department up when we finally take you know the vote on it. So I do want folks to know that it's currently not implemented 
we're still, this is why we're having this conversation. I'm grateful that, you know, Council Vice President Palmasano allowed this transparent and public forum for us to actually um, talk more thoroughly about this. Um, second, to follow up to Council Member Payne's uh, question, um, from my understanding, there were already uh, plans made around the pilot process, specifically for BCR, um, for a two-year period, I would like to hear from the staff, which I know was OPI, that designed this, um, and also would like to hear their thoughts about, you know, pilot process, what's the integration, um, integration process you think is best fit based off of kind of past presidents with initiatives like this. So I would like to hear directly from the staff on that piece. All right, so I asked questions through you, Commissioner, but did you want to direct that to staff, or who'd, how would you like to address that question? No, that would be fine to direct it to staff. I think they would be in a better position to respond to some of these questions. Great. Mr. Smith? Councilmember Wansley. Chair Palmasano, Mayor, Commissioner Alexander, Brian Smith, Director of the Office of Performance and Innovation. Uh, direct questions would be helpful so I don't just like throw stuff at the wall and hope I answer what people might be thinking. But um, we did plan the pilot. It's called a pilot, although it's in a general fund uh, with support from council, with support from the mayor's office. So it's a part of what we do at the city. Um, the reason why we call it a pilot is because we know in building something new that it would take at least a couple of years of learning, of tweaking the program, um, setting good metrics, getting information back from those metrics, and also tweaking the program based on that. We also know that it's not just the BCR in of itself that we had to work with, that we have weekly meetings, that we, at least we used to have weekly meetings, with 911, with MPD, with Canopy, who's the vendor that does the program for us, uh, as well as 311. And oftentimes meetings with Reg Services and anybody else that was involved in, in the development of the other alternative responses that we have as well, other than BCR. So part of the thinking around the two to three years was knowing that it's so new, there's so many moving parts, there's so many partners, uh, and that us coordinating all of that work with those partners um, took some time um, that when we do things, it affects everybody in that process. And then if they did anything, we had to make sure that we were constantly communicating with them because it affected you know, one person's moves affects everybody else's moves. And so that's been um, a great learning experience, but it's not been easy. Uh, and to essentially move the program at this point would mean somebody would have to probably learn all of that all over again. But we're still in the, we're still in the infancy of BCR. It only launched December 13th of last year. So we, would, we were under the impression that we would still be uh, under that two to three year uh, process before we handed it over to somebody. Uh, it's not that OPI wants to hold on to it. I mean, it's our baby to a degree, but it belongs to all of us. But at the same time, um, we work with people to build things, to help them with technical assistance, and then to turn it over eventually. Uh, something of this magnitude, that's the reason why we're holding it on to it for um, two to three years. But usually it's about a year and we pass it off to people. But it's usually stuff that is not to this magnitude, smaller programs. Um, that's just the way we do things because we're not in the business of becoming an operational place where we run programs day in, day out. Uh, this was very different and very unique. And so that's why we put two to three years on it. Um, if there's any specific questions that you'd like to ask because uh, one of the other things and I'll just throw it out there and if you want to hear more you can say so if not I'll stop but um, prior to uh, the murder of George Floyd when we got this work 
Um, we were tasked with doing a lot of things uh, in OPI and looking at a lot of things with regards to public safety because we could see where things were going um, with regard to a more comprehensive public safety approach uh, and not always um, making public safety synonymous with just policing. So we were asked to do a lot of things and we were asked even to look at what a new Department of Community Safety, Public Safety, or who knows what the name would have been, uh, would look like and how that would evolve. Part of why, part of what we came up with in the evolution of that, we never got a chance to share that publicly with anybody, but part of what that evolution would look like was um, the department that Commissioner Alexander is running now, that it would, the way the department would develop, whether question one or two, I mean, the ballot initiatives pass or not, we know we were going in this direction, would to be to stagger how these things worked. That they would eventually need to be under this one umbrella, but to stagger them and not to just move everything immediately because we thought the first thing we would have to do, and we were having conversations with everybody around the city about this, was whoever came in to run MPD would have to work with MPD and changing what we all agreed needed to be changed. This is not my words. Uh, the culture of MPD. And in changing the culture of MPD to go towards what we hear the mayor say quite a bit, which is police, community-oriented policing. And we know that that takes time. But to integrate everything under that one umbrella while still trying to work on the culture of one thing would likely lead, and at least in our opinion, would likely lead to the culture of MPD currently without that being worked on, then spreading that same culture because it's a dominant culture under public safety to all of the other prevention alternative models that we were coming up with. And so we were recommending that it be staggered, that police first, and then once enough work was done with that, then we stagger in prevention or alternatives, not my choice to make, that would be up to who's, who's ever running the department. And then that way, once that culture was worked on, we would then be, have a more comprehensive way of looking at public safety that involved all those things and not just one culture. Because what I still hear today sometimes is that we, um, we speak of prevention and alternatives and how they relate to MPD, as opposed to talking about public safety broadly and more comprehensive. And so we, we thought that as you stagger those things in, one culture doesn't rub off on another, but you actually continue, you're continuously building a culture that makes sense for everybody. And so we have those recommendations still. We're willing to share those. Uh, I don't want to go too far into a lot of stuff because I've not had um, a chance to talk with Commissioner Alexander about what he thinks about certain things, uh, share information with him. And so I don't want to go too far into having a conversation publicly and have a bunch of conversations go back and forth and then some assumptions be made about what Commissioner Alexander does and doesn't believe about the comprehensive public safety strategy and maybe even, maybe even um, staggering certain programs in which could be aligned with what he wants and what the council wants as far as when you pass stuff, when you pass budget stuff. But that's, that's just my thoughts on the BCR, the other alternatives that we're working on, and this whole um, Department of Community Safety and how things could possibly be staggered. But I don't want to jump ahead of that without having conversations with uh, the commissioner because I haven't had a chance to do so. And I was out for 10 days. So, so I'd like to just set some context from, from our understanding and from my new colleagues in the room. Um, the role of the Office of Performance and Innovation has always been performance measurement and innovation. And that's led that division um, to work on a number of things over the years. One of the things that has been happening for several years and was happening before 2020 was a 911 call analysis to see what kinds of alternative responses might we be able to develop to respond to 911 calls where maybe the best response is something other than having um, 
peace officers and squad cars show up. Maybe we could be more helpful by innovating other kinds of responses. Um, that uh, one of the, I guess the out, one of the main outcomes of that has been the behavioral crisis response team, which is the Canopy contract, where we have a contract with Canopy and have those people as contractors as one mode of response. Other things we've done um, to innovate our uh, resource issues with MPD and develop other kinds of alternatives to response has been in the traffic management area, um, and, and that has been helpful. I think one of Councilmember Wansley's questions was really about how do we both continue the work of innovating more responses for public safety needs while also creating those critical performance measurements needs and holding holding our different responses to them. Um, so thank you. Uh, Council Member Wong, yeah. do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I do want to clarify. I, my question was definitely answered. I think it was more about the what is the protocols or processes we've had in the past around integration, especially of these newer uh, public safety beyond policing uh, initiatives that we've led in the city, and I named specifically BCR, and I think that was definitely crystallized in terms of also with the timeline that it seems like Mayor Fry is proposing. I would like to see a commitment from Commissioner Alexander that we do allow BCR the time it needs to fully get flushed out. I'm glad that we have a process in place that is doing that performance measurement and eva evaluation of the program before it gets into you know neighborhood safety because I think we all here have the goal of wanting to see this program not only just thrive but also be successful. So it seems like we already have a two to three year kind of plan. It seemed like that's in alignment with what I just heard about like integration. So that piece was named. Um, I do want to segue because I did have additional questions um, before I know other colleagues get in queue. Um, so I do want to shift gears. Thank you so much, Director uh, Smith. Um, so the couple of questions that I have, and these are mostly for you, Commissioner Alexander, um, at the public hearing, your parts, your public hearing specifically, um, I named a primary concern of mine is, you know, the Office of Community Safety um, just not being used to rebrand MPD. Um, and to have it be something, and it seems like I've heard this from you, um, have it be something fundamentally new and holistic. Um, I also raised a number of questions during your public hearing, and you were honest. You, you know, you said you need to learn more. Um, it's now been a month, and I'm assuming, you know, you've read a lot of the key documents around, you know, the MPD staffing study, the after action report, the MDHR findings, as well as the mayor's uh, public safety work group recommendations, as well as the Harbor Safe and Thriving Communities report. Um, so I know that's a lot of also contextual information that's going to be useful in, in this implementation of a new department, and I know your work is just beginning, but I wanted to hear your specific plans for some of these areas that I'm about to raise, because I do want to note, um, last November, around question two, one of the biggest things that thousands of residents, you know, loudly resound, re just resounded across the city is they want to hear specific plans about our public safety initiatives, especially as we're doing this transformative work. Um, so first, I wanted to hear about what is your reimagining like our responses to encampments? I know the mayor has also mobilized MPD um, towards uh, our encampments and clearing them. Um, now that you do have shared authority with MPD alongside the mayor, do you want to continue that practice or do you think we can find other ways to respond to our unhoused neighbors and, and our encampment crisis that has not gone away um, for several years? Madam Vice President, Council Member, Member Wansley, I'll start off given that much of this regarding encampments is a, is a directive in the executive function as opposed to specifically coming from the commissioner. Obviously, a lot of the work predates his time here. Uh, the use of police officers uh, in both management as well as demobilization of, of encampment is geared towards protecting the additional staff like public work staff that have at times been assaulted, um, not by people experiencing homelessness, but others that have gone to the encampments themselves. Uh, so that's been the purpose of 
of ensuring that we have police officer presence at the demobilization of, of encampments. Uh, it's been a request that has been made both by regulatory services as public works for the safety of their staff in doing their work. Um, and that is a, a, a request and a recommendation that I have supported in asking for the assistance from police officers uh, themselves. Um, so that, that has been, you know, the, the commissioner can certainly speak to additional information that he may have or, or insights that he has gleaned in the last month or so. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that the context was set. Commissioner? Yes, thank you. And thank you for that question, uh, Council Member Wansley. I think it's, you know, here again, a very relevant question with a lot of relevant issues that are, that are at play here. And certainly all those documents that you've just articulated that I had an opportunity to review, yes, I have. And that probably have taken 30 days in and of itself because there's been a lot to cover here. But let me talk a little bit about philosophically where I am in regards to many of these social issues that you are referring to. I'm looking forward actually to have an opportunity here on Friday morning to meet with uh, uh, Director Brian Smith because as you heard him say, we had not had an opportunity to talk about uh, many of the issues that he sees as being very relevant and very important as it relates to BCR that directly I think is very important to uh, the advancing of public safety in this community. And we think about very, some of these very sensitive social issues that you refer to, I think we have to begin to look at them in probably a far more sensitive manner than maybe what we have in the past. And I think we're gonna to have to come up with new and creative ideas as to how we approach these issues. Uh, because certainly in some of these old cases, they have not worked very well for us. And we've heard from the community here about that as we hear from communities across the country who are crying the same thing. And it's, I think it's important that we address these issues uh, as it relates to more specifically around MDHR report you, re you referred to, uh, the issues that are there, we have to look at and address and make some resolve around as well. Uh, but I think as these, as, as I continue to meet with and have conversations uh, with people like Director Smith and to be able to hear what their challenges have been, how they foresee public safety in this community, and how do I tie that in with the five departments in which I'm responsible for? Uh, because there's a lot of work to be done in the area of public safety but it's not just the work that needs to be done, that needs to be done, but it's also how we approach that work, uh, I think is hugely important. So I am uh, still uh, learning, if you will, uh, about the concerns of this community, but I'm also very aware of the fact, I think a lot of these issues we have to look at and begin to find alternative ways to address them. And I think that's what you're alluding to. Um, I do have kind of, a, well, follow up. I, I do want to name, like, is there a specific plans? I want to note, we brought you on as, of course, an expert. You know, we also designated a sizable salary of 300000 because we wanted to recruit someone with great expertise on these issues and that could bring forward specific plans because that's what the voters and our constituents have named time and time again that they want to see um, in our public safety efforts at the city. So is there any specific things that you're looking at leading? I heard, you know, some of the broader approach around social issues I think that you were trying to tie that to the, the specific dynamic of, you know, our growing housing crisis and then how that leads to our encampments. But do you also, I think in this next piece, like something specific, um, and I think this might be helpful. Um, Dr. Offtelli, because he's been working with you all, I think, around this comprehensive piece. Um, he came to the Public Health and Safety Committee back in July and talked about some of these comprehensive components um, and what would be necessary in this department to really make it a holistic model. Um, he named you know, intervention and prevention as key pieces. I know that work is underway already at the city. Um, he also named restorative orient oriented services as well as resilience oriented 
enhances services as part of a larger human service approach. Um, what is your plan and timeline on implementing, you know, programs? And if you would like to cite one that you think from all the information that you've gathered, and I do want to note, you know, it's been a month, but you've also, I met with you back in June. I know you were here leading up our national police search. I emailed you many of these documents. I know we've had conversations about this. So thinking of if there are specific things that you're looking to bring forward in implementing under those two other components um, that, you know, we can support you in. I can't tell you specifically, uh, I can't respond to that question specifically because what I have in front of me is a succession of a great large number of issues as it relates to public safety. And many of those issues, the programs you're talking about, we have programs now that I'm still trying to understand and what there's in, in, in their importance and how they work and how they operate. I've been here 30 days, and in those 30 days, I'm also still confronted with some of the basic fundamental elements around public safety I have to deal with in many of their areas of responsibility in which I've been given, such as 911 and police around recruitment, uh, lack of personnel, and those issues that evolve. And even as we think about uh, these other social programs, even in OVP, beginning to have a clear understanding of what their function and, under, and, and, and what their roles are. So being able to read something off a piece of paper is one thing, but to be able to engage it and talk to those who are responsible in those areas in real time in terms of what their challenges are is entirely something else. So I think in regards to your question, uh, and do I have something specific in mind? No, I do not. And I'm not going to sit here and make up something. But I am going to say is that I think the trajectory that we're on in trying to stand up an office that has not been stood up yet in the time that I have been here, the short time that I have been here, no time has been wasted uh, on not trying to be clear about what it is that we need to do in public safety in this community. It encompasses a lot of things that you just just outlined. Uh, but I'm still learning and I'm still trying to figure that out. And that is going to take some time. And that's the only way I can respond to that uh, realistically in re you know, to you. Madam Vice President, Council Member Wansley, I can respond with some additional information as well. Uh, first, you know, several of the areas outlined, be they social service or housing support, are largely done through other departments within our city, and in some cases, other jurisdictions beyond, like Hennepin County. Uh, the commissioner has already made uh, not just the intention, but has met with individuals at both in these departments and other jurisdictions to determine what programs are already underway just so that he's not setting up a new program that is duplicative of one that's already taking place. Uh, and additionally, uh, there are uh, proposals that you know, will be coming out uh, in the relatively near future in the topics that he is in charge of. Um, now, are, are they ready for prime time at this point? No. Uh, they're not, uh, because the work still needs to take place and we need to get it right. Uh, but the work is most definitely underway. Thank you. I'm going to move on to Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, I did have some questions about timeline, but I think a lot of those questions have been addressed through Council Member Payne and Council Member Wansley's uh, series of questioning. And so I do just want to make a few observations and maybe offer, I think, some suggestions. I think that we've heard from uh, Director Smith that there's a two to three year uh, transition period or, or, or review period for this new, for the behavioral crisis um, response, uh, and we're less than one year into that. Uh, I think that there is, uh, I think that there should be a conversation about taking the time to make sure that that work is solidified, that the culture of that department is solidified uh, before they're having to reintegrate, re, you know, kind of refigure themselves out. Uh, I think that that's a valid request. 
I also know that, at least through the, the, the short introductions that we saw, that every single one of those programs, um, including behavioral uh, uh, crisis, are a 911 response, uh, except OVP. And, you know, and one of the things that I've seen from, uh, from, from um, uh, as OVP is given presentations is that there's this question about the, um, about the violence interrupters. People always ask, are they 911 sort of deployable? And, uh, and the response is always no, because they're not a 911 service. Uh, and then people always ask why. And that tells me that we still sort of have a bit of a, uh, uh, a knowledge gap between what the department should be, what it, uh, what what people kind of want it to be, and I feel like that misunderstanding really needs to be solidified as well. And so I think that in both cases, it's appropriate for us to start discussing maybe a longer timeline, and not to drag it out, not to drag it out beyond three years. But I think a slower timeline could help departments solidify their cultures. Um, and solidify and, and help the public understand what they should be, especially in the uh, realm of the interrupters who were rolled out uh, almost a year ahead of time and asked to do things repeatedly outside of their scope uh, because we were all learning and, we, and the whole city was in crisis. Uh, but what that created was a little bit of confusion about what they should and shouldn't be doing. I think that confusion is being rectified now, and I would hate to see that remedy. Uh, uh, be interrupted by, 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 by a premature, uh, premature integration. Uh, and I think it's appropriate to have those conversations because, um, you know, Commissioner, I think that you obviously have a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of expertise in, in policing and also 911 response. Uh, but I also think that there's a little bit of a learning curve for these other responses. And a learning curve is, is, is not a personal failing, right? That there's, no, there's no personal failing in not knowing what you don't know. Uh, but I do, see, I do see some value in, uh, in extending those timelines out. And what I'm hearing is that we're hoping to prop this up by the beginning of next year, which is months away. Uh, and that feels like it could be very disruptive uh, to the development of these very, very new programs. Uh, the last thing... Um, uh, I guess the point that I guess I, I would, I would want to make is that one of my fears in integra into integrating things immediately uh, has been that, uh, that instead of uh, MPD's culture sort of being influenced by these other departments, it's that these other departments will then be influenced by MPD's culture, which, you know, <clears throat> you and the mayor have plans for. I'm excited about those plans. Um, uh, you know, but I would hate to see departments that saw themselves as quasi or auxiliary to policing only and not full, fully fleshed out departments on their own. Uh, and so, and I think, you know, I think certainly 911 and fire are departments that are old enough and have enough standing to not be very impressionable by the, the culture of other departments. And I'm not sure if, if we're there yet with these, newer, um, with these newer programs that we're trying to integrate. And I fear that we could begin the process of slowly undoing them if we don't, if we don't integrate them correctly. So that's, that's more of a suggestion, not a question there. Uh, uh, I think that the questions that I had were, were largely addressed, again, by Councilmember Wansley and Councilmember Payne. Thank you. You know, I, I do want to just mention, again, this is something that Commissioner Alexander is very new to. Um, We've had the money to put together this behavioral crisis response team for two years now. And I think what we're ultimately here being concerned about is at what point do you take something that has been in incubation for a while and you say that it's ready to stand on its own. And I think that one of Commissioner Alexander's challenges as well as all of the directors of these departments is you know how we're trying to create something new here a brand new kind of culture and it sounds like from the way that you presented this morning that it is one of working together in a way like never before um, and I think what you're hearing here um, what people are hearing here in this discussion is more um, concern that there are dominant cultures here and that's not what we want to just assume the culture of this new Office of Community Safety. So I think, I mean, you don't have to comment on that, but I think that 
I just want to voice that, that that's a theme that I'm hearing and that I've heard for several months um, as an objection. Commissioner, did you? Yeah, yeah, I would like to respond to that. And you're absolutely right. And I certainly do hear very clearly uh, what Council Member Ellison is saying in regards to uh, uh, policing. Policing is a very dominant culture. <laughs> it is. Uh, and I think the influence and impact as we advance policing uh, in this community is going to be very important as to how we stand up all of these different programs together and giving them the opportunity to mature. Because one thing I'm learning, uh, Councilman Ellison, even in further discussions with uh, 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 Interim Director Josh Peterson, as I learn more even about ONS, OVP, is becoming very clear to me how much I did not know. And one thing I've even suggested to him and his staff is that they also have the opportunity to take time and to share with other departments within public safety, i.e. police, et cetera, exactly what it is they do, how they do it, and, and what their boundaries and what their boundaries are. And that has been, I think, beneficial in helping us in in, in that regard. But to be able to move along comprehensively, I think we can do that. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of information to take in as we stand up, so. And Ma Madam Vice President, if I may, uh, that's part of the value of having these departments in together at the ground level because they are in charge of setting up their culture. They set up the culture that is a new culture with Commissioner Alexander's leadership from the very beginning, rather than create a culture and then bring someone in later on. That was always the intention. Uh, that was always the goal in creating a comprehensive approach was to do exactly what we're doing right now. And I think right now it's more of following through on the promises that were made. Um, and we can do that in a thoughtful way. Um, I could go on, but I, I, I will stop. I, I, all I'll add is that, you know, uh, to Councilmember Ellison's point, there is a lot of work that OVP and ONS does uh, that may not have been known by Commissioner Alexander and maybe was not even known fully by some of the other entities within the Office of Community Safety. Uh, I, I don't think I'm betraying any confidences in, 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 and I say that the commissioner told me just the other day that uh, ONS OVP had the opportunity to present on a range of things. You know, obviously MPD was, was heavily involved with group violence intervention, and so they knew everything about GVI. Um, I think there's probably other entities, whether it be you know, 911 or fire or, or police, that didn't know all of the other micro details, and that's part of these meetings that have already been instilled. Thank you. I think there's also opportunity for some of the specialty units of um, of MPD that maybe aren't active right now, whether it's different um, community intervention teams or um, crisis intervention teams or GVI kinds of teams that, you know, maybe putting them together in new ways with, um, with Director Josh Peterson, <laughs> sorry, I had trouble with your last name there for a second, um, that we might be able to innovate and bring back online in some, in some new way. So thank you. Um, Councilmember Chavez. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. I think I have a bit of questions, and the first one is mostly, one, thank you, Commissioner, for being here. I was just wondering if you can walk us through a little bit of like what the new role of the crime prevention specialist is under this new Office of Community Safety. I'm not sure if I understand. I'm not sure if I understand the question, please. Yeah, so it is my understanding that the crime prevention specialists, it might be from the mayor as well, okay. are moving and shifting to a different department or office. And I think it would just be good for us to understand what that new process is and what their roles with the council offices will be moving forward. Yes, Council, Mem uh, council Vice President, Council Member Chavez, it's a really good question. Uh, so there have been, I think, a number of outstanding issues involving crime, pre crime prevention specialists as well as the navigators. Uh, my hope and goal on a broad level was to bring 
uh, crime prevention specialists, or at least a chunk of them, and navigators back to the Office of Community Safety generally. Now, crime prevention specialists, as you know, were previously all allocated, all of them, I think there's 17 in total, am I right? 17 in total uh, that were previously all under the purview of, of MPD. They were largely uh, direct reports to uh, the inspectors of each respective precinct. Um, there is some utilization there, um, but we can also shift up some of the positions. I believe it's actually in the budget for this year. Um, so, you know, I, I, rather than give you inaccurate information based on the numbers, um, we can get you that. It's, it should be in the budget book that has been produced, uh, both what cr was, what's going on with the crime prevention specialists, those particular positions, as well as the navigators. Perfect. Oh, um, I haven't done yet. I have a few questions. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And I have a few other questions, and I guess the second one is mostly about the five new staff positions in the city attorney's office. It's regarding uh, the charging decisions and also regarding the MDHR report. I'm just trying to figure out if there's a specific breakdown under this new office and how that's going to work. Is there a breakdown in regards to how many are going to be dedicated for the consent decree and how many are going to be de dedicated to charging decisions? So just to be clear, this is, this is a study session on the Office of Community Safety, but I think a relevant question yeah. would be about how, how do the new proposed positions in the city attorney's office work with this new Office of Community Safety or not, or do you have any thoughts about that? And I'm sorry to rephrase your yes. question, but I'm just it was trying mentioned to make it topic yeah. specific. It was on the presentation, so basically there's a breakdown of these positions, or is there any of them that are gonna be specifically working with the new Office of Community Safety or not. It was on the presentation, so that's where my co conversation's coming from. Madam Vice President, Council Member Chavez, given that some of the positions are designated to assisting with a, a consent decree's a, a, approval and implementation, of course they will be working with uh, the Minneapolis Police Department. We can give you a, a better breakdown. Uh, again, it's in the budget book. I just don't want to give you any inaccurate numbers. Uh, but yes, of course, some of those positions are dedicated specifically to consent decree. And, and as you know, there's also a pot of money that we've also allocated for uh, objectives and um, directives that have not been given yet through the consent decree itself. Thank you. Um, my third question is mostly directed to the commissioner. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Office of Community Safety. I know that right now it's going some, through some changes. Oh, there's this new office. It's a standalone department. has a new name change. I know you're leading conversations on going line by line on the Office of Violence Prevention and wondering, which I know is important, but I'm also wondering if this new role and this new office, if you're going to be going line by line to the Memphis Police Department's budget as well to see what works and doesn't work. Yes, I am. And one thing I'm going to be consistent about is that I'm going to explore and I'm going to ask a lot of questions. And things that I don't understand, uh, it's not just because I don't understand them, it's also because I'm hearing from the public that don't understand them. I'm hearing from other sources. I'm hearing from even people on the council who may not understand. So it becomes important for me to ask these questions, but OVP has not been singled out. But OVP is, is, as I'm learning OVP, if you will, uh, even in the last week, I've learned a lot more than I have in the short time that I've been here to the thanks of, uh, of, of uh, Interim Director Josh Peterson. And we've had some pretty prolonged and protracted conversations around these things. Uh, but yes, uh, everyone is going to be looked at deeply because what I'm held responsible for are going to be questions that many of you on this council are going to ask me later. People in the com community are going to ask me, and I want to be as as abreast as much as I can as I learn uh, about all this as we stand up this new office as well, uh, too. So, yes, sir, to your question. Everyone will be on the same level of, of observation and questioning, if you will. Thank you. I'm going to move on to Council Member Koski, and then I'm sure we're going to have enough time at the end to come back to Council Member Chavez and others that might want to put themselves in queue. But we're trying to stick to the one question, a relevant follow up, and, and keeping the conversation moving. So go ahead, Council Member Koski. Thank you, Vice President Palmasano. 
Appreciate that. Uh, this is for Commissioner Alexander. I just, uh, I know in the presentation there was uh, noted that there's gonna be five added FTEs for the beginning stages of your the new office. I was just wondering if you had a vision of those five FTEs each of the roles and responsibilities. I know it's been 30 days, but if you have an outline or thoughts and ideas of those fives, I'd love to hear it. Well, you know, once myself and uh, Becky Bolin, who has been recently assigned to me now as an aide, we're pretty much running that office. And, uh, and if you, any of you have an opportunity to come visit us, we there in room 115 and we operate from a long desk and it's just she and I. And, uh, Nothing stops because it's just the two of us, but the hopes is in the near future, I will have a chief of staff, I will have an additional aide, and uh, several people assigned as public information uh, officers as well, which are currently assigned unofficially, if you will, uh, until we officially stands up, stand up. So, you know, you know, one of the challenges when uh, you're standing up an office is such, you learn so much as you go along. Uh, but right now we're learning how to do a whole lot with very little uh, because the process of this is, you know, is slow. But it has not in any kind of way, uh, and I got to give a shout out to Becky Boland on this, uh, it has not in any way uh, stopped her from helping me, uh, quite frankly, guide me through the hallways and the uh, and the uh, issues that come about and places I need to be and things I need to be aware of as we stand up. But those, F, uh, uh, those five FTEs are going to be, I think, uh, critically important uh, to the daily functioning of this office. Uh, and, but each one of those positions, for me, have to be very smartly and, heavy and very care carefully evaluated as who those individuals are going to be because this is a very sensitive job. Uh, a lot of sensitive information comes across my desk as a result of it being public safety because it oftentimes just not involve us internally, but a lot of information uh, of high level, the high value also come from our state partners and our federal partners. So we have to be very vigilant in making sure when we stand up, we have the right people. Madam Vice President, Council Member Kosky, just to add briefly, uh, the three overarching pieces that would be in that office in terms of employees would be Chief of Staff, Administrative, and Comms. Uh, several of them uh, are repurposed positions that were already in existence, and you can see those through your budget book, and we can answer any questions that you may have on that front. Was there a follow-up, Councilmember Koski, or no? Nope, that's great. Thank you. Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have a question about, so we, we know the topic of the staffing levels has been well explored. Uh, I'm trying to explore how we're utilizing um, overtime resources. And without getting into a lot of the complexity of our history of overtime off-duty and buyback contracts, uh, I'm wondering if you could speak to how you, from your law enforcement experience, think about that type of flexible expansion of our capacity and how we're, we best deploy those resources. Yeah, well, uh, uh, let me say something first of all. I think that we all are at the realization that being down 250 police officers is hugely hugely impactful upon any workforce and uh post COVID, post george floyd uh you all have had this experience and it is employing a great deal of overtime uh, and we're still struggling to maintain a level of public safety uh in which this community can have a sense of confidence in because we are strapped and we are strapped uh, 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 in a very impactful kind of way, and I think we all very aware of that. But I'm going to ask uh, uh, Interim Chief Huffman to respond, if you don't mind, Council Member, who has much better, clearer insight, and I think going to articulate and expound on some of the things I've just stated. Thank you, Chief Huffman. Thank you, Council Vice President. 
so uh, as many of you know, um, with a current staffing level of around 560 active officers of all ranks in the department, um, we have been struggling to maintain staffing levels in the precincts that provide the service that we hear from communities that they want and need. Um, that includes response times um, to priority one and two calls that make people feel um, like they live in a safe community. Um, so in order to address that issue, we have been offering overtime um, for officers to come back and work additional shifts on top of their regular shifts uh, in order to keep those staffing levels up. The same thing is true in investigations. You know, we understand that for all serious crimes, the way to get uh, a day in court, the way for a victim to access the criminal justice system is through a police investigation. Um, we've lost a significant number of staff in investigations as well. Um, and so our current investigators are working overtime in an effort to be able to get more cases into the criminal justice system so that offenders can be held accountable for the harm that they've done and victims can pursue their day in court. So in addition to overtime, we also have officers who work um, off-duty and buyback. Um, the technical differences between those programs um, are slightly wonky, um, but essentially buyback is uh, contract-based. And so those are either organizations um, like neighborhood organizations or businesses that enter into a contract with the city for specific kinds of policing services. Um, you're very familiar with many of those because we've had some extensive discussions about those buyback contracts. Um, and then off-duty employment is the third category. Off-duty employment in the city of Minneapolis um, is uh, largely a program that takes place outside of the police department itself. Um, we have certain policy requirements around off-duty employment that require that um, the site itself where an officer is going to work off duty um, must be approved and registered with the city. Um, and we have policies about what kind of locations uh, are eligible for off-duty employment. There's some certain types of businesses that are excluded. Um, and we have requirements for officers in terms of the procedures that they use when they work off-duty employment for a private business. They must respond to uh, police calls for service that take place at that location, and they're required to um, of course, comply with all of our policy and procedures. Um, and then we have limitations about the total number of hours that officers can work. So that includes all of those categories, regular employment, um, overtime employment, off-duty, and buyback. So together, all of these are providing the public safety policing ecosystem um, that is present on the street at any given time. And the follow-up, if I may. Um, is it not a safe assumption to say that buyback contracts and off-duty shifts are in direct competition with the core service of um, patrols and responding to service? So I would characterize it slightly differently than that. Um, obviously, people are assigned regular work shifts, and so there is nothing else that's in competition with everyone's regular assigned hours. Um, where we do have competition that arises is between overtime shifts of all kinds, whether that's a buyback or um, a shift staffing overtime and off-duty employment. So that is where the, the competition, as it were, arises. Yeah, uh, so I just, to the commissioner, would hope that you, you know, line by line look at that and kind of think about how we're deploying our limited resources and how we're prioritizing those deployments based on the various programs and what the rationale is for those. Yeah. Madam Vice President, Council Member Payne, yes, you're right and agreed uh, on this topic of competition, certainly between overtime work and off-duty work. You run the numbers, the, the, the pay that they are getting from some of these outside entities is, is significant. And at times it's significantly more than that which they would get from an overtime shift. I have to commend uh, Chief Huffman, who has done an incredible amount of work on this very topic uh, over the last several months. Bigger changes have been made um, to both off-duty and overtime over these last several months than you know the, the, the prior decade or two combined. Um, and and it, it's significant, and it, and, it, and it has been making a difference. I, I, I anticipate that there will be more um, changes uh, and, and asks on that front that will come across your, your table shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Vita. Thank you, Vice Chair Palmasano. I just I have a quick question. I'm, I'm a little bit confused because I thought we were having a conversation about government structure 
and not about policy and programming. So I'm wondering how we're going to communicate to community about government structure. If I was watching this meeting as just a regular community member who was interested in knowing what's happening around government structure, I would think I'm right. I'm, like watching the wrong meeting. So what are we going to do as a city to communicate to folks this process, how we're getting through it, timelines, all of those things, like in a more precise way? Yeah, well, I guess I'll start and I'll pass it along to Mayor Fry. Um, this is a study session on the Office of Community Safety and everything around it. Um, I saw Council Member Payne's inquiry one about just generally how we're addressing and responding to safety given you know, the low numbers of responders that we have at large. Um, and, and to me, that, that is relevant as to how we start to put this Office of Community Safety together. Um, I, I can pass it along to Mayor Fry if, if you want to go ahead and take a stab at it. But this is, we, we have gone, I'd say we'd veered around the edges a bit. Um, but in terms of the Office of Community Safety, this is meant to be a, a deeper conversation and an informal one at that while I am it is. working to facilitate this. But Council Vice President, wanna... Council Member Vita, it, it's a good question. You know, we need to make sure that people are well aware of both what is getting set up and when it's getting set up, when these ordinances are coming forward, when the public hearings will take place. Uh, and obviously, it's, it's, happy, it's been nine or so months now. Uh, but but in, it is happening, it is coming forward in the relatively near future. Um, I'm failing to find the exact dates uh, for the council calendar here in my notes. Um, Mr. Clerk, I don't know if you have some additional dates that you can provide, and just to provide a backstop here, the, the goal here is to, well, first is to get up, is set up as quickly as possible, but as a backstop, we need to have it set up prior to the um, you know, in, in October, preferably in early October, prior to the beginning of the budget, because the presence of this office has implications for the budget proposal itself. If we don't do that, it, it, we enter, a, it, it becomes more of a mess. Mr. Clerk. Madam Vice President, to the council members, I think very succinctly, the two study sessions today are preparatory to the introduction of a full-scale omnibus ordinance that the council is aware of. That ordinance would implement the proposed organizational structure that the mayor has proposed as refined and finally adopted by council. The current schedule has that ordinance being presented publicly to the Committee of the Whole's Government Structure Subcommittee at its regular meeting on Tuesday, September 20th at 1.30 in the afternoon, uh, following that public presentation, questions and answers with attorneys and other staff, uh, any directions from the council at that time. It would be our an, an anticipation that the council would set the public hearing on that ordinance. The public hearing would be conducted in the next cycle uh, of council, so at the Committee of the Whole meeting on October 4th, Tuesday, October 4th. Following that public hearing, uh, any recommendations or final actions, amendments, and perfections offered by the council to the omnibus ordinance uh, would be taken up and considered, uh, finalized, acted on by full council, and a final vote could happen um, as soon as October 6th or certainly thereafter at any council meeting based on the council's own uh, timeline that it comes up with to finish that work. As the mayor indicated, and as we've said before, uh, the structure imposed through that ordinance then has significant implications for the budget in 2023. And so the hope is to have the first piece completed well in advance of final consideration and the three public hearings that are already on the council's calendar for the proposed 2023 budget. The 2023 budget is set for final consideration and adoption on Tuesday, December 6th. So I think the key uh, calendar dates for the public at this point are Today's two study sessions, the September 20th meeting of the Committee of the Whole, the October 4th meeting of the Committee of the Whole government structure where the public hearing would be, and then any of the uh, committee and or council meetings thereafter until final action. Thank you. Um, are there any follow-up questions to this or any other points that you would like to make, Mayor? Um, that is the track that we're on. I also reminded my colleagues that 
you know, we have these two study sessions today and also for our next round of looking at the drafts of this omnibus government restructure ordinance, we do need any changes you wanna make to this very first draft in by the end of today so that we can prepare those documents for briefings next week. We'll get back on that weekly schedule of briefings soon. Council Member Wansley. Thank you. Um, so my question is around victims of uh, fun. And I know earlier uh, you noted that it, it, it's hard for you to kind of employ some specific suggestions around programs and initiatives. Um, and I would encourage you for this one, because I know this is something that you raised at your public hearing that you had interest in. If you could point out to a model, one model um, that you've seen in your um, expansive uh, career, around how victims funds have been organized, kind of your visions for it. I think, again, voters made it very clear. And I think a lot of this year's work around public safety um, on both sides is wanting to get to more concrete, specific plans for how we're gonna do this work, how that embodies good governance for all of the elected leaders in this space, also including you as a politi political appointee. Um, people want to hear concrete plans and specificity to know that okay, we can have some accountability, we know what to expect. So you raised this at your public hearing, interest in a victim's fund, can you share a little bit more about your vision around that? Victim's funds? Uh, you, you shared a victim fund. Can you give me more context? Oh, this is just something you raised at your public hearing? I, I need more context, I understand that, but I need more context because victim's fund is very expansive. So if you're gonna bring that up, uh, then I need to have the context in which I set it because whatever I say, I put in, uh, in some type of context. So if you can clarify the context, I can respond to the question. If you can't clarify the context, then I can't respond to the question. Again, I wanna note this is the words that you shared and it could have been around maybe your vision around programs. Again, this is your words. I can't say what you I, mean by I, that. I understand I, you Just one moment. Um, and maybe you do just not have a vision around that, and that's fine, but you, you shared that, and I was really interested to see how you were looking to like innovate that work here at the city. Yeah, I don't, I don't recall the context. If you can provide a context for me, I can respond, and we can do that offline, or we can do it back here. It's okay, but I need a context. So uh, I said a lot of things, and everything that I've said, I stand by. So if you are able, somehow, to help me understand better what that context was, I would gladly would like to be able to respond. And in regards to programs itself, there are a number of programs that I'm becoming acquainted with. And I think even the programs that we currently have in the place, uh, and there's a number of them, I still need to understand exactly what it is and how they do things. So in terms of creating new programs, I would be remiss to do that right now, not even understanding with a, with, with a department that we're still yet to stand up uh, as to what it is we're currently doing where we don't have to repeat ourselves all over again. And we, God knows we got a lot of programs. So I'm, I'm, I'm truly council member uh, Wansley trying to learn the programs that we currently have in the place. And if you have some ideas about programs in which we could employ, I would be more than glad to talk to you offline about that. Uh, so I wanna be open to that as well too. Yeah, and I think wanting to have this opportunity to learn from you more right. so um, in your 20 plus years of experience, especially 40 when plus. it comes to, sorry, 40 sorry, plus. 40 plus. And then particularly around the comprehensive aspects of public safety. Right. So wanting to hear what models you've seen, you've worked across the country, here's an opportunity for you to shine a spotlight on some of those things. Not saying you gotta create anything new, but like things that you're seeing um, right. and excited about, would like to bring here. I think any expert is often learning from other cities. I think you've shared some of that. Right. And seeing here's an opportunity for you to showcase that and this new vision around public safety. So that's why I asked for, are there other models you're seeing? I'm not asking you to say, where's the list of programs right now? Right. But models that you've seen that you would like to incorporate in your vision. Specifically, again, I referred to something you shared around the Victims Fund. I thought that was something exciting to hear about. We have something like that at the state level. Um, and also even around, you know, some of the things that Council 
member paying raised around mm -hmm. staffing minimums. Mm -hmm. I will ask this last question because I also asked this at your, your last public hearing, and you know that you need some time to think on this. So we do currently have a staffing minimum for our MPD officers. Uh, Chief Huffman somewhat spoke to some of the challenges of you know that dynamic, and I would encourage you to look at the 70-30 kind of provision that contributes to those those issues within our staffing within MPD. But I also ask if there was interest or any openness towards like having staffing minimums for this newer level of work around public safety alternatives. Um, we're going to need a workforce for that um, and one to mandate some parity between those two. Do you have like an updated stance on that or updated thoughts on that for that yes, particular I do. area? Yeah, yeah. Let me, yeah, let me respond to that because currently, as you just heard, the chief state, we're down to 550 police officers. To get back up to where we need to be is probably not going to happen anytime soon, even in our most aggressive uh, uh, recruitment programs, such as one we're doing here this week and going to continue to do over the next number of weeks. So to your point, and I agree with you 100 percent, we really do have to begin to think about, and I've been at the forefront of this, quite frankly, uh, since uh, Michael Brown incident back in 2014 where we're going to have to begin to look at today, how do we take the number of police officers that we do have, understanding that these numbers are not going to be filled anytime overnight. So when we rethink policing, when we think about transformation, if you will, and I prefer to use the term advancing policing, we have to think about uh, 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 public safety in a much broader context, such as what we've been talking about for the last couple hours. For an example, how do we expand our mental health program? where we have more mental health professionals who are able to, to respond to non-threatening calls, right? And, but not, a, not only just responding to those calls, but also getting out ahead of those calls because we can go through our CAD system and we could look and see residences that what I refer to as frequent flyer residences where we respond all the time for mental health calls, but there's no follow-up. But if we were to take those addresses, if we had civilian mental health clinicians who could go and knock on those doors where we have been a number of times, where police have been a number of times, and provide some service before people get into a situation where they are confronted with police, that can turn south. But we have trained people in place. I think that's hugely important in an environment where you have a large percentage of your calls for service now probably have a mental health component attached to them. And then when you start talking about the homeless issue, which is a very complex issue, which is to me symptomatic of a larger problem in our society that has to be addressed beyond that of police. Because if we can address those issues, then police will have a less the likelihood of having to engage with a homeless population. But that's a broader subject, way beyond the scope of my training and professionalism, right? Uh, because that is a symptom of a larger problem in public safety, public safety being lack of education, poor education, I should say, lack of housing, lack of health care, lack of social supports, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Some of those basic mass law needs that oftentimes these people may not have. So I'm with you. So when I think about the idea of how to address public safety uh, in this community, we have to think about it wholly. You're now on the same page, mm -hmm. but it's addressing it wholly. And it's going to be a huge lift because it's going to be a shift, shift in not just police culture, but in a community's culture in terms of how police have seen and experienced. So I'll stop there, mm -hmm. but would be more than glad to, you know, uh, uh, in a sidebar, have these conversations with you if you would like. Yeah, absolutely. Thank I you. think those comments are definitely promising. We'd love to continue building with yes. you on that. Those components of recognizing there's so much more to public yes. safety than just cops. Absolutely. And how we can work together on doing that. I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, um, we do have one more council member in queue. It's council member Rainville, but we are out of time. Um, it, it is important to be prompt, so I guess Councilmember Rainville, I'm not opening this up to further discussion. Did you want to just quickly have the last word, or did you want to take your question or comments offline and work with these people that you see every day offline? Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> I, I want to be brief and concise. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Dr. Alexander, thank you so much for your outreach to the other jurisdictions that affect our public safety, whether it's state, county, federal. Uh, 
And when you do talk to them, please emphasize all the, the problems that the opioid addictions is having on our community, especially fentanyl. That has to be part of the solution to get this fentanyl crisis behind us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank sir. you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for being part of the study session. I hope that you found it valuable. I will be seeking out feedback from everyone um, about how this went for you. We have another one this afternoon um, that starts at 1.30. I'm looking at the clerk at 1.30 promptly that was meant to give us all time and space to get back to whatever we need to do in our office, um, grab some lunch um, or what have you. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for participating and we'll see you at 1.30.